sure that your computer is also muted. Um, and in just a few minutes, we'll get started. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us for this year's State of the IA webcast. Over the course of the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to take you through our quantitative and qualitative findings in regards to the very complex 18 to 24 year old youth and young adult market. At the end of this presentation, you will have the opportunity to participate in a Q&A session where you will have the chance to ask any questions that you may desire directly of Yaya consumers themselves. We're going to take all those questions from Twitter and from Facebook, so be sure that you're tagging us at MojoAd with any questions, and also use that hashtag, Life Between the Lines. We are all a part of the MojoAd team, a full-service student staff ad agency specializing in all things young. My name is Delaney LaFon, and I'm an account planner here at the agency. I'm Miranda Cowan, one of the copywriters. My name is Zach Sandeman, another account planner here at MojoAd. I'm Nathan Snodgrass, one of MojoAd's media planners. My name is Dan Lee, and I work as a researcher. And I'm Madeline Sutherland, and I'm also a researcher. All right, let's begin. There's a life stage marketers keep missing. It isn't Generation Z, and it isn't millennials. It's a group of overlooked consumers, torn between two opposing sides. This consumer both represents and defies generational stereotypes. They are complex and at times capricious. The IO market is comprised of 31 million people in the United States alone, making up an approximate $82.4 billion in total buying power. They're about to decide between the brands they've used their entire life, or try something new. If marketers fail to connect with them, they could be missing out on a lot of opportunity, as these 18 to 24 year old consumers continue to further develop their brand loyalties with each passing day. So take a moment to consider all the research you've consumed and everything that you know about Millennials and Generation Z. At first, generational stereotypes may come to mind, but these ignore important complexities and nuances of the Yaya life stage. We want you to look between the lines and discover this often neglected point of view. Introducing Life Between the Lines.
Meet the youth and young adult market, or as we like to call them, Yaya consumers. The Yaya market is ever-changing and extremely complex. So complex that you might think it would be impossible to be an expert on this life stage. But we've come to know these 18 to 24 year old consumers quite well because we live and work amongst them every single day of our lives. We are the Yaya market and we don't shy away from digging into the depths of this life stage to better understand our peers. We are living the Yaya life and we're ready to share with you our experiences and our findings. The current Yaya market is unique. They overlap two distinct generations. And yet, after all the dialogue surrounding these two generations, the Yaya consumer has fallen between the lines segmenting Millennials and Generation Z. So how do we discover this complex, ephemeral Yaya consumer? That's where the State of the Yaya comes in. This year's State of the Yaya report goes beyond the generational divide, and it discovers life between the lines. In September 2017, we conducted our online survey that included over 700 Yaya consumers nationwide. The survey covered everything from Yaya media usage and their aspirations to spirituality and how they feel about their food. We used this data to better understand the behaviors and the attitudes of the Yaya life stage across the United States. To help you and your brand connect with the Yaya consumers, we have developed six key insights based on our primary research and secondary sources. Within each of these insights, we uncover tensions between what the Yaya consumer hopes for and what they feel is realistic for them to achieve. We encourage you to look for discrepancies between what the Yaya consumers say they believe and what they will actually do. It's important to keep in mind that a unique tension between Yaya consumers' attitudes and their behaviors exists because they embody characteristics of both the millennial generation above them as well as the generation Z's below them, and those values can often contradict. Life between the lines is full of unexpected twists and turns. Yaya consumers find themselves caught, not only between two generations, but also between the opposing left and right in the political world. But when it comes to news, humor bridges the divide so that they don't have to. Sometimes the upheaval in the news media can be too difficult to face. According to our research, 45% of Yaya individuals indicate they consume less news media today than they did before the current political climate. This creates a dilemma for the Yaya consumers because 63% actually feel more confident when they're informed with the current news. In order to stay in the loop, Yaya consumers are still seeking out news. They're just using different methods to do so. For example, Yaya consumers are starting to stream the news on their computers instead of using regular cable. In the first quarter of 2017, Yaya consumers spent 37 hours a month watching video on a computer. That's a little over an hour a day. Today's late night shows blur the lines between entertainment and news. That's fitting because over half of the Yaya consumers that we surveyed said they like their news to be presented in an entertaining way. Hearing John Oliver or Trevor Noah crack jokes about current events can provide a much needed escape from the divisiveness plaguing their daily lives. In the midst of stressful times, Yaya consumers appreciate brands that adjust their tone by softening the delivery of their message without sugarcoating its importance. These consumers value being informed about serious topics, but they like the added safety net that humor can provide, especially when it's able to smooth over tension between those with opposing viewpoints. News organizations need to understand that Yaya individuals are consuming information in a new way. Just because a message is professional or earnest doesn't mean it can't be delivered in a fun or entertaining way. News organizations and brands alike could adjust their strategies, both in tone and where the media is placed, to tap into this humor-loving group. Another way Yaya consumers deal with this ongoing tension is substances. This life stage agrees. Their stress is constant, but their risky coping methods are just temporary. In an open-ended survey question, Yaya consumers say they typically deal with stress by using substances or sleeping. Substances are a way for Yaya consumers to take a break and relax. For example, 45% agree that marijuana helps to cope with stress. When Yaya consumers are being real with themselves, they admit they do worry about the dangers of addiction. Approximately 60% of the Yaya consumers we surveyed said that they're worried about developing an addiction to chewing tobacco prescription pain and anxiety medication, and prescription stimulant drugs. Now, while these Yaya consumers are concerned for themselves, they do not wish to hear these concerns echoed by anybody else, and especially not those of the generations above them. 
We found that Yaya consumers believe they're using common substances more than their parents' generations did. They also believe that those within their own age group are more accepting of drugs like marijuana, e-cigs, and the recreational use of anti-anxiety and pain relief prescriptions. Because Yaya consumers identify with each other's high stress, they foster some understanding for when their peers may look to these drugs for the sake of temporary relief. And ultimately, this may be normalizing these drugs within this age group. Since stress is a major motivation for using these substances, Yaya individuals are likely to tune out any kind of conversation that has to do with these risky tendencies, especially if it sounds like a lecture from their parents. When advertising to this group, use language that understands instead of scolds. Understanding that these consumers use substances to cope with their stress can also help marketers reach the Yaya individuals. Marketers could position their products as a tool for stress relief to reach these consumer base. Society educates about the dangers of tobacco products and irresponsible drinking. But as some of this market shifts to other substances, public awareness and education could shift to address this change. When creating public health campaigns, it's likely to be more effective with this demographic to foster conversations about alternative, healthier coping mechanisms, rather than condemning substance use as a whole. There's another vice that this life stage has a tendency to turn to, and that's food. Our third insight, snacking provides comfort in the demanding lives of yaya consumers. Even since their early childhoods, this snack pack generation may be eating for emotional reasons more so than practical ones. When asked, what do you do when you're stressed, the most frequent responses were to eat or snack. Good days or bad days, Yaya individuals could count on a tasty treat at home or at school. Rough Little League game, they would often drown their sorrows in zebra cakes or popsicles. Have you ever heard of saying, treat yourself? Yaya consumers see food as a stress reliever and a tiny reward to get them through the day. Our research finds that 67% of Yaya consumers snack when they're bored and 68% snack to hold them over in between meals. While food may not fall into a specific routine, it's definitely a staple in the everyday lives of the Yaya consumer. 64% believe that they have time to sit down for a meal. However, half agree that they often snack instead of eating a full meal. Why this contradiction? Well, 73% of Yaya consumers believe that it is too expensive to eat healthy foods. Sure, they'd love to sit down for a four-course meal with their friends, but they typically rely on a granola bar, or three, on the go. Because Yaya consumers are snacking for emotional reasons, it's important to communicate with them in a way that removes guilt. Over half of the Yaya consumers we surveyed said that they don't think restaurants should have to include nutritional information on their menus. They do not want to be reminded of how many calories are in that Dairy Queen blizzard they just ordered to help them get through that bad breakup. Food marketers have the opportunity to tap into these emotions by positioning their brands as rewards for this life stage. With busy schedules and seemingly endless responsibilities, a snack along the way can provide a major source of motivation or encouragement, especially if its messaging is assuring, just like a homemade snack from mom. Another reason Yaya individuals don't have time for a sit-down meal is a crazy busy college schedule. This population is starting to see college as a hoop they have to jump through in order to pursue their true passions, despite being the most educated demographic. 10.9 million have some sort of college under their belt, while 2.9 million have obtained a bachelor's degree. It is no secret that the Yaya consumers, young adults today, are facing a student loan epidemic. In fact, our research finds that 56% of Yaya consumers consider college to be a risky investment. While attending university can cause sticker shock, it's not the only aspect causing Yaya consumers to question. In fact, only 8% believe that a traditional classroom education is worth more than real-world experience. Despite this lack of confidence in textbooks and theories, today's young adults aren't ready to remove higher ed from their life plans. But they are looking for ways to cut costs and make time for those invaluable experiences, making alternative ways to earn degrees more acceptable. For example, 63% agree that online classes or degrees are a great way to save money. Increasingly, the Yaya demographic is choosing to believe that a degree, regardless of the source, legitimizes them and sets them up for success. Over half of the Yaya consumers we surveyed agree. An online college degree is just as good as a traditional one. 
As Yaya consumers continue to endure all-nighters in the name of their post-grad careers, their perspective on the value of education can provide some important takeaways for the marketers trying to reach them. For Yaya individuals, words on a page only go so far. Experiencing a product firsthand provides a valuable insight for marketers who wish to see Yaya individuals engage with those brands. Engaging their senses through experiential marketing allows young adults to absorb your brand's messaging in a more impactful way, similar to how internships bring boring textbook concepts to life. Brands can engage Yaya consumer senses just as effectively through video. In 2015, YouTube drew 31.8 million users aged 18 to 24, which is 98% of that demographic. No matter what the medium, presenting your brand's messaging in engaging ways is essential when targeting today's Yaya consumers. After school, Yaya consumers hope to find success and long-term happiness in their lives. But today's Yaya consumers grew up between two very different worlds. They witnessed the tumultuous financial crisis of the 2000s while also growing up alongside an era of rapid technological development. This creates a conflicted consumer who wants to dream big but likes to keep things realistic. But they know that being pragmatic doesn't keep them from being dreamers. Yaya yeah, yeah, individuals like to test things out. According to our research, 63% plan on living with a romantic partner before jumping into a long-term commitment. They operate similarly in the professional world with risk awareness behind every move they make. Before they chase after bigger, grander goals, Yaya consumers will want to find financial security through a reliable career and a home life. Yaya consumers think reality is tough, but they remain optimistic about their futures. 71% agree that it's tough to find a good job nowadays. However, 60% are confident that they'll have their dream job within the next five years. This life stage pragmatism should encourage marketers to develop strategies rooted in security and independence. Their dream is that one day their hard work will pay off in the form of a large investment. For example, while renting may be necessary for now until they've saved up enough money for a down payment, 98% of Yaya consumers say they plan to own some type of home in the future. Yaya consumers have many passions, but they pursue those passions with humility and hard work. They've learned firsthand that the world does not bend to their will. You have the opportunity to build a relationship on trust with this life stage, as long as you notice Yaya consumers' emphasis on realism. Straight talk that acknowledges the gritty truth about the sacrifices that can go into every life achievement will resonate with them as they're making the transition into adulthood. Older generations tend to think of today's youth as insanely progressive. But Yaya individuals actually have more traditional tendencies than you might expect. While their values are rooted in old paradigms, they could be called the new traditionalists. The Yaya market is receptive to the progressive social shift in culture outside of their own lives, but they also tend to put traditional constraints on themselves. As new traditionalists, 63% agree that both parents need to work today to make ends meet. However, about half agree that one parent should be staying at home when raising children. This need to support their families and work towards personal success conflicts with Yaya consumers' preferences towards traditional behaviors in the home. 77% believe that gender equality is important, but when it comes to mowing the lawn or cooking dinner, 40% still believe that traditional gender roles are helpful in the home. While today's Yaya consumers are not adverse to a traditional home life, their perspective is quite different at the workplace. Approximately 63% of the Yaya consumers we surveyed said they believe gender to be irrelevant in the workplace. These progressive views are affecting how this life stage works, but also how they shop. 41% agree that, old, uh, that gendered products are old fashioned. So even though Yaya consumers may embrace their gender roles in some situations, they want to see their own style, not a gender stereotype reflected in the products that they buy. Within this population, there's a variance in how they embody this open-minded thinking in their public and their personal lives. Family ideals transcend gender, even when the family looks different. The Yaya consumer wants something rooted in tradition, but something completely new. They want the closeness and the security a family can provide, but they also accept that their world is evolving. They want to interact with brands that incorporate modern relationship and exhibit traditional values in unconventional ways. 
Marketers must take the time to do their homework to understand this target's unique balance of traditional and progressive views in order to work with them within the context of personal and public life. In each of our insights, we found a constant pull between what the Yaya consumers say they believe and what they will actually do. Today's Yaya consumers were born between two generations, so their birth dates do not always accurately represent who they truly are. Because their characteristics often conflict, the Yaya demographics experience is complex and uniquely their own. Not Generation Z, not a millennial. They are living life between the lines. And since all of you have taken the time to join us here today, you are clearly invested in understanding this elusive life stage. When it comes to the complex Yaya consumer, every detail surrounding them matters. Brands that can understand and work with these key insights have the potential to form a relationship with a demographic whose spending power increases long after they exit this life stage. These insights have immeasurable potential to move brands forward, but there remains so much more to be uncovered about life between the lines. If you're interested in learning more, please visit us online at mojoad.com, where you can download your own copy of this year's State of the Yaya report in full. We hope you all leave here today with a strong understanding of the current Yaya consumer. We're so happy to be able to share our findings with you today. On behalf of the entire Mojo Ad team, thank you for tuning into our webcast. And now I'd like to at, uh, invite our additional Mojo Ad members up here for our Q&A panel, and we'll take any questions that you may have from our Twitter feed, Facebook, or here in person. Thank you, guys. Okay, so we have one question from Twitter. What was the most interesting fact that you all found? Uh, the most interesting fact that I think we found was um, in the family and relationships part of the survey that we conducted. Um, we found that 40% of Yaya consumers don't feel safe using dating apps like Tinder. Um, and so I personally thought that that was like a pretty significant number um, out of all of the Yaya consumers that we surveyed. In my opinion, uh, the most interesting thing that we found was um, the correlation between addiction risk when it comes to substances like chewing tobacco and then these prescription pain and anxiety pills and prescription um, stimulant drugs as well. So those numbers were very similar. It's almost like the IA consumers feel um, the same level of addiction risk for all three of those substances, but we've grown up like avoiding tobacco because we see it as an automatic addiction risk but we're still using these other drugs that we see as the same risk level for addiction, but we're using them with a higher propensity. So I found that to be a little bit interesting. So uh, you guys talked about some of the things that yayas are doing to cope with stress, with substances and ice cream and stuff like that. Um, did you ask why everyone's so stressed? We did actually. Um, I believe, from my recollection, that one of well, some of the major factors include fin financial life, um, school job, careers, um, if there's any more to add. But I believe those are the top stress factors that we have found. Finance, what else? Finance, school, career, um, relationship, actually, I think it was one of them. But those are the top that can come to mind. Um, so you guys had a really interesting area where you started talking about health and like unhealthy foods. And something that I took away is that they don't want to be reminded of them being unhealthy or unhealthy ingredients. And I was just curious if you guys had a point of view on what that fine balance is, especially if you do work on like a health brand, what is the correct way to talk about health to Yaya's? 
Yes, so they're definitely, like you mentioned, they're definitely trying to find a balance between being healthy and then also indulging at some points. So one of the facts that we mentioned is that they don't prefer um, to have calories listed on menus or um, you know other places. And that's not that they don't want to know them. They still would like to know the nutritional facts and what they're putting in their bodies, um, but it's not always their top consideration when they're making the decision. So definitely still keep those facts present uh, for people who do want to consider those more. It's just not their top priority. Um, and I'd like to add on to that too. So we found that um, 73% of Yaya consumers say that they think eating healthy foods is too expensive. So if you have a healthy food option that is in their budget, is more affordable, that would be another point to drive home because the majority of the people we surveyed and Yaya consumers in general believe that they can't afford to eat healthy. So it's not that they don't want to eat healthy, it's just they perceive it to be out of their budget. I think it also depends on the product being marketed. If, if, if they're eating this product or consuming this product as a result of their stress, they're not going to want that extra reminder of not only are they stressed about perhaps external reasons, but they have to keep track of what they're eating and how healthy they are. So I think, I think personally, um, since stress is a common theme, especially with the section on substances and food, um, that is probably one of the major motivations for why yeah, yeah, individuals don't want to be reminded of, of that. It's, that. it's that extra layer of stress that may, you know, make them a little bit more bothered than they need to be. In what areas, so you talked about the like um, traditionality of the yayas, in what areas do you find um, that they're most traditional? And then in what areas do you find that they're pretty open to um, like being innovative or just kind of taking a more modern approach? I can speak to this one. Yes. Um, so kind of like we talked about in the presentation, within their home lives, and so like within a family dynamic or they're, if they're living with a partner, perhaps those traditional um, gender roles are seen more there. But when they go into public life, so in the workplace, when they're buying products at the grocery store, et cetera, that's where they want to see less gender norms represented and um, more open-minded things represented. In addition, um, we also surveyed people on like, would you be willing to date someone who has different political views than you? Would you be willing to date someone who has different religious views than you? And overall, um, from my recollection, Yaya consumers are pretty open-minded to dating people who have different beliefs than them across the board. So it's not that they're a closed-minded group of individuals. I think it's just that maybe we're still hanging on to or linging on some of those um, traditional values within our own family environments or friend environments. Okay, another question from Twitter. Um, could you please explain the methodology of the survey? I can feel that one. Uh, I believe we collected a nationally representative sample of over 700 uh, respondents, and then we collected their data. We filtered out um, the um, respondents that were clearly not uh, taking it seriously, and then we um, analyzed data based on um, our find. Our, we extracted a findings based on our analysis of the data. So anyone who wasn't 18 to 24 obviously was screened out. Um, and then as well, as people that are like involved in the advertising industry, they were screened out because they would maybe kind of know what we were trying to get at in our survey. Um, but we sur surveyed people from across the entire country, like Dunn was saying, over 700 respondents. Um, and yeah. Oh, and um, we weighted the respondents based on the census data to match the national demographic spread. Um, you all talked a lot about stress and about um, the coping mechanisms in terms of substance use. Um, did you all find in your research anything in relation to art and how yayas might um, express their stress through art and specifically the use or creation of music? I, I don't believe we included that aspect in our investigation, but I do think that's a very valid uh, point and I think that it deserves more attention and maybe we'll think about um, digging into that aspect next time when we do that. 
Um, I'd like to add on to that question too. So while we didn't delve into those specific topics in the survey, um, we did find through our analysis of the data and our insights that it would be more helpful for them to hear conversations about alternative healthier coping mechanisms rather than condemning substance use. So this could be an area where it could be offered as an alternative coping mechanism. Um, so that would be a good way to approach this when, when marketing it as a stress reliever. Um, so you mentioned that 73% of yayas believe that it's too expensive to be healthy or to eat healthy. Did you determine or um, in your research did you kind of find what is considered affordable for yayas? So are you asking like, like what a price range yeah. would be? Mm -hmm. um, we didn't ask a, a specific question about like what's your normal budget when you go to eat. Um, so I don't know if we can, maybe Don can speak to that. Um, yeah, we decided to leave room for personal interpretation because everyone's circumstances are different. Uh, what I consider might be expensive and it might be very cheap for you. So we didn't include a specific price range in our questionnaire, um, but it's left for personal interpretation. Okay, we have a question from Facebook. Do you think Yaya consumers are motivated to seek mental health help? Whether it be meditation apps, video therapy, actual therapy, et cetera, it seems like they're coping unhealthily, and this user is wondering if this generation is motivated to seek alternative coping mechanisms. That isn't something that we really asked about in the survey, um, but considering that they are looking for um, you know, other things to deal with their stress, um, that may be something that we're open to, but we can't speak to that specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we also found out that there are um, coping mechanisms that may be unhealthy, like the use of prescription uh, drugs without the prescription for it. Um, they do have concerns about the risk for addiction. Um, they just don't want to hear it from other people. So it's not that they, they believe that what they're doing is healthy. They just don't want to hear it from other people. So that could mean that they are open to hearing alternative ways that they can relieve their stress. Um, so they, that is a possibility. Also, um, I think you can find a lot of secondary research on this as well, and I think that's why we didn't dive too much into it in our survey, the whole um, subject of mental health, because it's a very big topic right now amongst this de demographic, and there's a lot of research existing that says, yes, mental health is extremely important to yayas. They consider it almost as highly as they do their own physical health. So um, whether or not they're motivated, we can't speak to, but I can definitely say that this demographic is considering their mental health um, in their everyday lives. So again, you talked about um, stress in the Yaya um, population. Do you think that's because of like goal orientation and holding themselves to a higher standard? Did you find that in any of your surveys? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it's interesting, first of all, that a lot of the questions here are about stress. Um, it's because that's a, a hot topic amongst people who are 18 to 24 like yourselves. So um, I think that whether there's this debate, right, of whether or not 18 to 24 year olds today are actually under more pressure to achieve things than people older than them. Um, and that debate to the 18 to 24 year olds we've found uh, is, is not really important. It's more so a feeling that they are holding themselves to that higher standard and they feel like more is being asked of them. And as they increasingly feel that way, it comes along with a lot more stress. And to add to that, um, it's also their perception of what they, they're looking forward to in their future. So we mentioned that they feel like college is a necessity, something that they have to do to keep on moving forward. It's this progression of goals that they're wanting to achieve, whether it's earning a degree and then having a stable job having a home, having a stable family life, those are all more like values that they are seeing as goals for themselves and they're lofty, like lifetime achievements. So I think that is a weight that we hold on our shoulders um, that we think about um, on an everyday basis. Hi, I just had a question about clarification for numbers. So with key, uh, key insight number two on marijuana usage and e-cigarettes, so I noticed there was a slide that had a lot of 60%. And was that 60% of people believe their peers are, peers are more accepting, or is that 60% of yayas believe that it's acceptable to use marijuana and e-cigarettes? 
So that was the number of people that believe that there are people within their own age group. So other 18 to 24 year olds are more accepting of them as uh, compared to other age groups. All right, perfect. And so then that, I have a question is, did you match that with um, asking the yayas, do you think use of marijuana and e-cigarettes is acceptable? And how did those numbers match up between what they believe their peers thought and what they actually thought? Um, I don't, I can speak on this. I don't believe we asked a question um, specifically, do you believe this is acceptable? But we did ask um, whether participants currently use any of those substances. And so the most utilized substances, as you might guess, were alcohol, marijuana, and then those were the, pretty much the top two that held the top two spots there. And then um, usage for the rest of the, the drugs listed, um, which I can um, give to you after this, if you'd like to see it, um, was like, farther down in percentage that said that they use. All right, thank you for your response. And then also, um, we also asked whether they thought certain uh, substances were useful for relieving stress or useful to focus or have fun. Um, but those were not that they necessarily were using them for those things, it's just that they believed that they could be useful in achieving those. Okay, um, did you notice a correlation between political affiliation and view on traditional gender roles? Um, this is a cross tab that I believe we did not run, um, but we have the, we have like a, to explain to you guys how this looks, we have a huge quantitative data report in which we ran lots of cross tabs, year over year comparisons, that's where all of our data comes from. So while we might not currently have a cross tab about um, political leanings and how they're associated with traditional value leanings, um, that's something that we can delve further into given w with the data that we have currently. Um, so that's something that we would have to get back on. So um, you guys talked to, uh, s seems like there was a lot of sticking your head in the ground, you know, don't tell me how many calories, don't tell me about the dangers of addiction, don't want to look at the news. And you mentioned that just on the news that humor was a way that the yayas would accept some of this information. Is there anything else in that? area that question that maybe there's other ways of how yayas can get some of this information that's sort of kind of important? Well, it's not that they don't want the news. They still feel more confident they're informed by the news and they like to stay in the know, but they want the news to be presented in an entertaining manner. That doesn't have to be um, humorous. It can be any kind of entertaining method, but basically you have to try to cut through the clutter where people are just too overwhelmed with the political conversation going on in the spectrum right now, and they want to have news delivered to them in a personalized and more approachable, um, accessible way. So um, not just limited to one emotion, humor, but it can be many other methods that can be utilized to reach these consumers. And in a more specific tactic, um, presenting that information in the format of a video would be probably the mm -hmm. most engaging as well, too, because we are spending so much time um, watching videos on mobile um, and online. So that would be a good way to specifically access our attention as well. Mm -hmm. And okay. along the lines of it not just being humor um, in to, in to create that engaging content, um, if you look at something like what the sports news world has done lately and seems to be trending towards, it's that concept of debate. Um, so having that conversation and putting that conversation in front of a Yaya consumer, whether or not they can actually engage um, digitally or not, just being able, giving them an environment where they feel like they're part of the conversation in their own living room is something that they're gonna want out of any type of news. Okay, we have another question from Facebook. Was substance abuse a particular focus of the survey? Uh, yes, yes, it was. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe just to clarify also, how we set this up is we identify in the beginning of last year, we go through a lot of secondary research and the entire staff does this. And so we look to see where all of that secondary research might point us to wanna know more. Like what's research that hasn't been done yet about this demographic that we can't already find? And that leads us to create areas like news, substances, family and friends, et cetera, 
where we want to kind of delve into a little bit more. And then how we set up that survey is we create blocks with certain amount of questions on each area. So that way when we finish the survey, we have kind of a comprehensive little snapshot of the areas that we were trying to capture. Okay, another question from Facebook. So those of us in the marketing world are continually told that young people place high value on corporate transparency in brands that are aligned with social causes, Warby Parker being a good example. How important is that to Yaya's, really, truly? Um, we, it looks like we have data on this. Um, I guess I'll let you start. So we did do a lot of testing on in terms of advertising and how brands can relate to the Yaya demographic. And it looks like, I just had it, I'm so sorry. Okay, yeah, so a majority of Yaya's, we asked them several criteria um, particular to brands, and it says the majority of Yaya consumers um, appreciate brands who provide me with helpful information, and they like brands who take a stand on social issues, and they prefer ads to show people of different races and cultures. So there is a big um, need for authenticity among brands as uh, we tested in our survey. And just to let everyone know here, the full report with all of this information that we're kind of referencing out of thin air or out of our minds is available online. So you can go and search that out if you have like particular questions or want to see a data point that we brought up, you want to see it in front of your face. Yes, with a hyphen between, yeah. Do you think that, I mean, most people when they're young have a lot of uncertainty because they're leaving their family home, they're leaving their age group if they went to college and they're going to be mixed with different age groups and different people and they're going to be expected to perform instead of advised and guided to perform. And so I'm a slacker generation, Gen X, you know, I mean the baby boomers were too competitive. You know, every generation has something that the people are critical about. So do you think this is a phase or do you think that they are going to continue to struggle more so than other generations? I can speak to this a little bit. So when we are realizing that there was this kind of change between the millennials leaving this life stage and Generation Z moving in. Um, the stereotypes that both of those generations kind of hold are that millennials, you know, want to go hike, you know, through Europe and, you know, you know, do fun things to really find their true identities. And then, you know, the emerging Generation Z is kind of resorting back to more traditional goals of wanting to establish a career right away, their home life. And so it is a blend of wanting to explore themselves, but also develop a you know, a more traditional goal-oriented life. So I think it has to do with, yes, the transition from moving into a new environment, whether it's in college or in the workforce. Um, but within that, it's also just the ideals and values of the two generations and, that are moving through this life stage. So it's a blend. Um, so the question is, is there this uncertainty, um, this stress that they feel, almost this angst, is that a phase? Um, I would say certainly yes, but within the 18 to 24 year old demographic, and it's important to, re to recognize that this is not a generation that we're talking about, it's a life stage. And so when these people phase out of that uncertainty, there are going to be 18 to 24 year olds who are thrust into this same environment and ultimately experience those same feelings. So it's going to continue. We also found that one of the points of tension was between their pragmatism and their dreamer-like tendencies. So whereas the majority believe that, that it is hard to get a good job, the majority also believe they'll get their dream job in five years. Um, so that's kind of like a conflicting tension point um, that could possibly stick with them throughout this life stage because they are kind of that blend between those two generations. They're dreamers, but they're also willing to work hard and make a plan um, to get their dream. And this could also be something that's contributing to that stress because they identify how hard it is to do and achieve their dreams, but then they also still go after them and are still making practical plans to work towards them. Oh. 
Can you hear me? Okay, hi. Um, so I'm sorry if y'all already talked about this, but I was writing a lot of notes during your presentation, so if I missed them, sorry. Um, but I was curious if you guys explored into how yayas are looking at college nowadays and if they find it as a necessary means of success, especially with the uprise of social media and Instagram and YouTube success. Um, do you see that yayas are still you know, actively pursuing college or maybe looking for alternative methods? Um, I believe the views on college are shifting, but so far in this life stage, they're still considering college to be a hoop to jump through and a necessity to succeed in life. However, um, there are cheaper ways to do it, and this goes along with us having more pragmatic approaches to issues in life, whereas we can take on, say, online college degrees to better attain this level of legitimization that can um, help us proceed in life, whereas um, we're not sticking toward a traditional approach to college where you have to go through four years, we have to pay a lot of money. Um, but also, uh, I talked about how student debt uh, is factoring into this a lot, where uh, we talked about how stress is a major factor, and a lot of the stress is coming from financial life, um, and student debt certainly is part of it. So it is sort of... Um, pushing us to think more pragmatically about college uh, instead of a more um, ideal uh, sense of how we go through college. Yeah, I would say that um, this idea of skepticism surrounding higher education is certainly ramping up. But at the end of the day, uh, Yaya consumers are still not able to completely shake the fact that the generations who are going to be hiring them still want to see that piece of paper. So although that idea is forming and seems to be trending and getting more popular, not yet, um, although they are still looking to pursue other ways to get that piece of paper. Yeah, one of the interesting facts we found is they don't perceive traditional classroom experiences to be as beneficial to them as hands-on experience. Um, so that's kind of a shift, I think, in their education. They think they're going to learn more from this hands-on than they will from this classroom experience. Um, so that could potentially also be a shift in the way we teach in colleges, how colleges approach education to try and engage this demographic, because a lot of them are seeing it as a hoop rather than something that will help them. Um, so that could potentially be a shift we see coming up as more and more people turn away from college to go to these cheaper online degrees, something that can just get the paper and then go on and um, get more hands-on experience. Yeah, I talked about um, how Yaya is in the generation with a life stage, um, but also about how, because of how nuanced and complex this life stage is, that ages, that the number of ages don't necessarily signify where you are in life. Um, so what are the markers or triggers that signify entering the Yaya stage and also exiting? So the Yaya stage is defined by 18 to 24 year olds. So where the age difference comes in and that they don't necessarily are assigned to their age is when you think about generations and the generation names of Generation Z and Millennials. So a lot of us in this room are usually considered Millennials a lot of the time, but many of us, you know, it's kind of a blur line, whether you're born in 1996 or 97, whether you fall into Generation Z or Millennials, and that line's blurry. So that's why we'd, it's a better picture of them to define them by the life stage instead of their, you know, more general abstract generation name. Yeah, I think a good way to think about it um, goes back to a question that was asked earlier about uncertainty. It's kind of like it begins right around that time that high school graduation is occurring and then sort of that six-year period that follows after, whether it's college, whether it's work or anything else, there's a lot of uncertainty that encompasses this life stage. I think that's the biggest thing, regardless of what they're actually doing. It's hard to place them concretely, whether they're in school or at work. But um, it's just that six-year period after high school, it seems, where they're trying to figure things out. Okay, another question from Twitter. You said in the report that 56% of yayas think the news is inaccurate, and 52% of yayas think advertising is untruthful. What are ways that advertising agencies and brands can build trust with yayas? We've touched on this a little bit with the previous questions, but establishing authenticity um, is a big way to do that and being true to whatever the brand is that you're trying to represent. Um, so obviously, if you're marketing a food that you know isn't the best for you, don't try to make it like it is healthier. Try to bring out those aspects. So stay true in what you're highlighting and what you're emphasizing. And yeah, emphasizing when you're um, emphasizing. Excuse me, when you are advertising. Um, and when it comes to news. Um, a majority of yayas do appreciate news that offers an opinion. Um, so um, 
making sure that those opinions kind of align or there's a broad variety uh, where they are seeing multiple aspects and perspectives um, and, you know, seeing the validity in those. I think also um, this life stage has experienced a lot of changes in social climate and social issues are a really big um, buzz for this market. They um, care about social issues a lot. And so sometimes I think that Yaya's also feel, and this might be just my personal opinion, but something I've kind of seen lately is that like we're being taken advantage of for having those cares and that brands are trying to take advantage of the fact that we do care so much about the world around us. Um, so I think as a brand, just showcasing, like Delaney was talking about, your authenticity, but also making sure that as a brand, you don't feel like you are um, trying to jump on just those cares and center people in for just the fact that they care about social issues and, and not take advantage of their, their caring. Um, to build on that, we also asked about the features of an ad that Yaya's would appreciate or pay attention to, and we figured, or we realized that um, featuring spokespeople like famous people, artists, or um, influencers from social media aren't as effective as we thought it'd be. Um, they're actually kind of phasing out um, in terms of um, Yaya's are just too used to seeing this approach. Um, so having to cut through the clutter is essential to building um, authenticity. And in regards to news, we actually realized that um, our research finds that people, yayas, are willing to pay for news if they know for sure that the news is real. So there is a lot of profit that stands behind it being able to st establish authenticity. So there is, it's a very rewarding approach in my opinion. Yeah, and I also think it has a lot to do with just being transparent and honest as a brand. Um, they've at this point been advertised to their entire life and they see a lot of advertising as nothing but mere ploys to get them to buy something uh, and so you know the old phrase is if you're complaining or explaining you're losing but it seems and I can't speak for all yayas but it seems like for this life stage um, that is a little bit less true perhaps they they do want to hear about a flaw that a brand has and they want to see that be acknowledged uh, one that I always go back to is Domino's what Domino's did a few years back when they had a product issue their food simply wasn't performing and they just acknowledged it they would air focus group participants knocking the food and then they had the CEO come on and say hey we're doing better and that like launched their brand into something that is much better today than it was a few years ago um, going off of that, what brands do you think are doing a good job of marketing to Yaya consumers? And on the flip side, what brands do you think could be doing a better job and how? Well, um, Dunn asked me a question today. We had the Apple PC debate. Um, I think... Uh, a lot of it has to do with the actual product itself. So with a company like Apple, you're dealing with something like the network effect where you know I'm looking around and I'm seeing nothing but Apple computers, really. Um, so I think they've leveraged a network effect in a community around their brand. That makes me feel like if I am an Apple consumer, I'm a part of something larger than myself. So, um, and there are, there's no shortage of brands that um, that are doing that, so maybe there are some that come to mind. Um, I also think Taco Bell is another really good example of a brand that's connecting really well with the Yaya consumer right now. Um, their social is just crazy. If you look at their engagement and you look at the stuff they're doing, it's very like out there, and the Yaya consumers are really liking it. They're engaging with it. They're retweeting them. They're loving it. Um, and so I think that a brand that is able to use social and not just use social in a way that they think that Yaya consumers are using it, but use it kind of like Yaya consumers themselves are using it, like with the Snapchat filter, with the taco head, or like those sorts of like fun, engaging things are a great thing for brands to be doing. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for brands to engage, engage consumers on social and not just kind of tweet at them, but tweet with them. Um, and that sort of area is a good area for growth. Also, we found that Yaya consumers really like pop culture, and just referencing some commercials you guys might have seen during the Super Bowl, like the Tide ads were super huge, and also the Doritos, and I believe the Mountain Dew, the pairing that they did. So they're meeting Yaya consumers where they are with things that they're already interested in, which makes them want to engage with the advertising without even realizing that they're being pushed a product, because they see someone from the TV show that they've been watching, or they see their favorite musical artist featured. So that's still a pull, I think, is involving pop culture into into some of your advertising as well as humor. 
So that's all the time that we have for questions today. We want to thank you again so much for joining us. Um, this has been a long time coming, so we're very happy to have everyone here and everyone watching online. And we just want to remind you that if you do have any more questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, you can always tweet at us, um, Facebook message us, and as always, get your hands on a copy of the current soy book. So thank you so much, and a big thank you to all of our presenters and Q&A people as well.